Yeah, Taylor's got it. Jim. So yeah, Taylor, did you get? Right. That's exactly it. So my echoing, is this sound okay? Okay. Good evening, Illinois College alumni and friends. Welcome to campus. I'm so glad to welcome you to this event, a conversation that we get to have tonight. Happy Alumni Homecoming Week to those of you who are alumni of the college. Uh, what, a, what a pleasure to be with you. I, I want to make a special, um, I want to offer a special welcome to our reunion class alumni, uh, particularly our class of the, of the 50th reunion class. I know that it's a disappointment that we can't be together right now to celebrate the 50th reunion and all of the other class years, uh, but we will when the time comes and we are able to be together again on campus, and I look forward to that. Thank you again for joining me this evening. I was so pleased to receive your questions in advance of our time together tonight. Thank you. I've incorporated uh, responses into opening remarks that I'd like to offer. I also want this to be an interactive conversation, although uh, those of you who are watching are not going to be on screen. I do want you to please put questions in the Q&A section of the webinar. Stephanie Chipman, Vice President of External Relations is going to be monitoring the questions 
and she's going to join me in this discussion a, a little bit later and uh, let me know what your questions are so I can respond to them this evening. Again, happy alumni homecoming week. We are going to have a student homecoming week uh, later in October. And I know that they already have a, a great set of uh, activities planned for our students. And we'll hope that the, the weather holds. It's been a gorgeous uh, fall on the hilltop. It's getting a little chilly. The leaves are changing. But you all know from being on campus that this is just one of the best times of the year to be here. And what a time it has been. I want to give you um, an update from the campus, what's been happening this semester, the uh, reimagination of the campus during this period of COVID-19 and the global pandemic. And I wanna tell you, first of all, how proud I am of our students and our faculty and our staff, both for the way they prepared to arrive on campus this fall and for all of the good work that's going on as I speak to you this evening. Our students are wearing masks, our faculty and staff are wearing masks. We are uh, enforcing that this is a, a mask only campus right now. We are focused on social distancing. And I'll give you some examples of how that is playing out on the hilltop. Now it's over six months ago that we were um, in that moment when the world changed and the governor was uh, moved the, the state of Illinois into a shelter in place. And the week before that happened on March 14th, I came to our faculty and staff and students, and I told them that with regret, I needed to name that we were going to move to an all online remote learning experience for the rest of the semester. So that was in mid-March. And so here we are. Um, great sadness in our region and in the world for all those who have uh, become ill from the COVID-19 virus. My heart goes out to those of you who have had members, uh, who have had family members and friends who have taken ill from the virus or have passed away. It is a, such a difficult time. And our priority on this campus is to have a healthy and safe environment where students can pursue their education. And I wanna tell you a little bit about what I've heard from students as they're coming into this fall and what's happening right now. Over the summer, we had a task force, uh, the 2020-2021 Contingency Planning Task Force. I chaired the task force. We had over 20 people on that task force, and we had about eight subgroups that were working uh, in, the, in all of the, uh, the planning. It was, a, it was a hub and spoke kind of system. The task force met weekly, subgroups were meeting at least weekly, and we just plowed through a, a large number of issues that had to be considered as we began the new year, uh, the new academic year, and as we hoped that we would be able to begin the new academic year. Uh, as you imagine, and of course from the press that you've seen around the country, uh, this was a question right up to the start of the academic year. The surge in late summer was not something that campuses across the country had been focused on, yes, but there was a great sense that the surge might come later, and, but we had to regroup. And so what I wanna tell you is that this campus has shown tremendous grit and resiliency and flexibility and the capacity to adapt to an experience that not one of us has ever had and uh, across the country, my colleagues were um, working with their colleagues on various campuses to try to get this right. Uh, and we are building the plane as we're flying it. And we've done the very, very best we can to provide for that safe environment, priority number one for our students, faculty, and staff. In terms of the academic experience, I am so very pleased that we have been in session since August 24th. Uh, 
there is, you know, every day we are monitoring what's happening. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in, in a moment in terms of the current health of the campus. But the academic experience, um, extraordinary work on behalf of um, our students from faculty, our IT team, uh, the entire, you know, the, the student success team, faculty have moved mountains to be in the classroom this semester. We're following what's called a hybrid learning model. That means that students, for the most part, are taking courses that are a combination of in-person instruction, which is so very, very important to the Illinois College model of education, with remote elements. Faculty have had to completely uh, deconstruct and reconstruct their classes to be in this environment. Not only did they prepare for the hybrid moment, which they, we hope to be in for the entire semester, they had to be ready at a moment's notice if in fact we needed to go online and to be virtual for the rest of the term. So a lot of flexibility, uh, adaptation, sometimes adaptation on the, on the fly. We have um, added classroom space to our campus because we needed to spread out. I am coming to you tonight from uh, Crispin Hall. I am in the Dell class of 1972 and Lisa Dunham Auditorium. And I am thrilled uh, to be here. I, I wish you could see the room as it normally is. It looks a little bit different right now because we had to take out some of the the space, um, so fewer students can be in this space. One of our subgroups led by the Dean of Faculty and our former Dean of Faculty uh, was to look at every single space on campus. And the, the buzzword is the need to de-densify. And so every classroom is at half of its capacity, which is one of the reasons it's important to have this hybrid model because many classes are, um, cut in half and one group is with the professor on one day and students doing virtual work on another day and then they flip. There are some classes that are meeting 100% of the time in person. There are a few classes with our full-time tenured faculty that are completely online. And we've also pulled some of our online courses from IC online to make those courses available to students who perhaps had an accommodation, they were not able to be on campus. Uh, our registrar, Helen Kuhn, uh, has been heroic in working through class schedules, uh, getting faculty situated. And as I mentioned earlier, our, our IT team, just phenomenal job. Uh, the, the amount of technology that we've, we have added into the system is um, substantial. And we were fortunate to be able to use some funding from a grant we've received from the federal government, the Title III grant, that's all about student success. We've been able to use some of that money for this investment in technology, but it has been um, an extensive change, uh, a significant change on our campus in terms of just every classroom being ready to go. We've also leased Lincoln Avenue Baptist Church, which is right down the, the hill on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, we have two classrooms there. It's going really, really well. Uh, our nursing classes uh, have been the stalwarts at Lincoln Baptist uh, Church. So we, we push on in terms of the academic program. It seems impossible, but we will be at midterm uh, before we know it. The academic calendar is different this year. We do not have a fall break in October, and we will be in this uh, hybrid model of learning on campus until the Friday before Thanksgiving. Students will have Thanksgiving week off. That's the trade-off for not having an October uh, fall break. And then the last week of classes will be in a virtual environment. And then finals week, will be in a virtual environment. Won't be the customary, the, the, the finals we usually have where everyone gathers in a room and they take their final exam, but each faculty member needs to have a, a substantive project, some work that's going on in that final week. So that's the way the rest of the semester is going to play out. 
The other significant change we've made on campus in response to the pandemic is that we've had to, again, de-densify, uh, this time in the residence uh, halls. We've spread out students. We have turned all of the uh, rooms in Turner into singles uh, for this semester. In other places on campus, whether it's the apartments or other rooms or other um, residence halls, we have moved from three, if there, if there were three beds, now there are two. If there were four, now there were three. And so we've had to pull out. And we had to replace those uh, beds and do more because of some great enrollment news I'm going to tell you about. But to help us in the de-densification of residential space, we rented, we've leased for this semester, next semester if we think we'll need it, uh, the Super 8 Motel, which is on uh, West Morton, not very far from the Lincoln Avenue corner of West Morton. Uh, and so we have students living there as well. We also expanded our space uh, by renting the Greenbrier Apartments, which are on Westgate Avenue. It's, a, it's an apartment complex that has a series of buildings. We were able to lease an entire building, which we will lease throughout this year. And uh, we have about 13 or 14 apartments in, in Greenbrier. And I can tell you that our students love Greenbrier and uh, we have been able to provide more independent living in an apartment style through this decision. I also want to note uh, that our board of trustees, many of our trustees are on this call tonight and, and, I, and I thank them for being here, uh, including the chair of our board, uh, Mr. Stephen Mills, who's class of 1977. I, I'd like to thank the Board of Trustees for their uh, dedication to the success of this institution. That is always the case. And in this time of the pandemic and the uncertainty that we've all been facing and the, you know, a hundred and a hundred more balls in the air at this college over the last six months. They have been steadfast in their support for our students, for our faculty, for our staff, for our alumni, for the enduring success of our college. And I want to thank them and let you know that they have been meeting over the summer as well. And that is, is, that is not their normal course of action. And so I'm just pleased that they were available um, so frequently to offer good counsel and to make decisions about how we would proceed. I had a question about how have we been able to uh, keep our numbers where they are. And I will tell you that we, at this moment, we've had, as of tonight, and I, and I always say to everyone, this is fragile. This could change tomorrow. And uh, I, I know that every single day when we start our work. But at, since March, we've had only six cases of COVID on campus. The first case was in uh, early August. Uh, we have three students who are recovered. Uh, I had late word before I came to this meeting that the three students that we would classify as active cases may move to the recovery column tomorrow or certainly over the weekend. And that's, that's fantastic news. So what are we doing? Uh, it has been a, an all-out proactive effort to encourage the campus to take care of each other. We have a community of care agreement that um, everyone has had to sign. And that community of care agreement talks about the protocol around masks and social distancing and washing our hands and taking our temperatures every day and being really careful about what we are doing outside of this campus. If, if, if one travels, be very careful about quarantining when uh, upon return and so forth. Uh, as I said earlier, I've been so impressed across the board with the adherence to the community of care agreement. And so I think that's been, an, an, it's undergirded our, our work together. We all talk the same language. And the other thing we're asked to do is to complete every single morning a symptom tracker. 
And um, that's our responsibility. It's the first thing I do when I get up. I take my temperature, I go into my mobile app, and I um, answer the basic questions about symptoms, whether uh, there, I've had exposure to, the, um, to someone who has had a positive case. Well, that's the easy part for me to do. I get a green dot, and I am glad to say I have been healthy. Uh, I get a green dot. And what happens after everyone has completed, and we've had, I mean, it's not 100%, but we are having conversations with those who are not great uh, symptom tracker friends, and everybody gets it. So we have a team from Chesley Health and Wellness, my goodness, they have been our North Star in this work, helping us to think through safety protocols. We have a, we have a very detailed COVID-19 uh, set of protocols that we've worked out in conjunction with the Department of Public Health, Morgan County, with the Jacksonville uh, Emergency Management Center, Chesley Health and Wellness, and our uh, sports medicine team in Bruner. They are following up every single day uh, with those uh, faculty, staff, and students who get something other than a green dot so that we can try to figure out, they can try to figure out, if a student is showing concerning symptoms that have persisted, or if this just might be a cold or allergies uh, or whatever the, whatever the case may be. That's an extraordinary effort. As I said, it happens every single day on campus. I am really thrilled uh, by the partnership we've established over these many months with the public health officials in our, in our region uh, they have been gracious, open, supportive of Illinois College. They wanted us to open this fall, and they wanted to provide us with whatever support would be needed for that to happen. Uh, my conversations are almost weekly with the uh, directors, and Chesley Health and Wellness is in touch with members of the Department of Public Health on a regular basis. They provided us with tests. Nurse Tammy Wright uh, has been trained and is able to do COVID-19 cases or, or tests on campus with all the appropriate PPE and so forth. Uh, and we're getting pretty fast turnaround right now uh, on, those, on those tests. So I hope that gives you a sense of the place. Um, it is difficult, of course, to be in a campus environment where we all want to be together, we want to come out from behind our masks, we want to do those things that are normal. And as I speak to you tonight, Illinois College Society members, I think we can all say we want to do the things that are normal in our lives. We want to do this again. And I say to our students, and we will, the time is not right now. Uh, but we are doing everything we can to provide the high quality liberal arts education that Illinois College is known for. Uh, faculty are glad to be back in the classrooms with their students. Is there some anxiety? Sure. Is, you know, there's a general sense of anxiety in the world right now, but people are pushing through. Um, the other image I will give you is that we have uh, three tents, very, very large tents up on the quad on the upper quad. And then we have another one down by, um, for those of you who think about a green space for a memorial uh, gym was, there was another huge tent there to help us with dining. But faculty members are reserving these tents. And during the, the good days of weather, which we've had almost perfect weather since we started classes, uh, they're out there with their personal mic. They've got their um, amplifiers and students are out there uh, in their masks and they are conducting classes. So everyone is trying to find their way. I'd like to talk with you about some of the other experiences that students are having on campus. And there are a number of areas that you've asked me to comment on tonight. And so I, I, I'm really pleased to do that. Um, but first, I'd like to share the news that I hope you've already received which is that Illinois College broke an enrollment record uh, again this year. We broke the, 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 uh, the college record last year. And I'm so thrilled um, to tell you that we have 1,150 students enrolled 
at Illinois College, FTE. Um, and that is remarkable, absolutely re remarkable. Uh, as you can imagine, we spent the summer as part of our planning and in conversations with the board focused on what might the pandemic do to enrollment? Would we see first year students decide to take a semester off? Would we see our um, juniors and seniors and sophomores come back? Would they take a semester off and, and uh, go some, to some other institution or go online? What would it look like? And um, the result is that we kept in touch with all of our students throughout the summer. We let them know about our Hilltop Ready plan, which is, the, is posted to the website. When you go to the IC website, right at the top, there is a, a link to the Hilltop Ready plan. I really encourage you to look at it. Uh, it's going to be changing as we get ready for spring semester that I'll say something about uh, later. Um, and the dashboard is there that I was telling you about that we're, we're um, publicizing what the incidents are of COVID-19 on campus for students. We're tracking that internally for staff and faculty. Um, and I'm happy to say that there are no active cases among our staff and faculty right now either. But the only thing that's on the, the dashboard um, that you'll see is, is the set of student numbers. So we kept in touch with them. We let them know what the plans were going to be. Our admission team just did a, a knockout job uh, to uh, hold the class and to prepare for, for this moment. Uh, our motto at Illinois College is that it takes a campus to recruit and retain a student. And you know, never was that more true than during the last six months and everybody rolled up their sleeves and got to it. Um, it's important for me to note that behind this growth, this 1,150 FTE, is years of development on academic, new academic programs, reshaping of academic programs, the um, development of co-curricular programs like in athletics, in music, and so forth. And it's that work, that, that creative work, that, that really focused work of our faculty uh, and staff that has been a collaborative effort across this campus. It's, it's, it's not always an easy effort, uh, but a collaborative effort to create new programs to reach new groups of students and to be thinking about what is it that the market's telling us about what students are interested in studying and how does that mesh with Illinois College's capacity to do this work in terms of providing a, a, a first uh, class education to them. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one is we did create an IC online program for adult learners. Uh, this is focused primarily in two areas, but other areas um, are, are, we're expanding in other areas. The first one was an RN to BSN program online. IC online is designed for um, learners who are professionals in their field uh, perhaps they want to advance their education, they want to complete a degree, they want to aspire, they're aspiring to a certain certification. And so our RN to BSN program online was a really significant shift for Illinois College in, in, in entering that space of the, um, the learner who is a current professional in his or her field. We have had a vision for a long time. Well, I also say also an IC online is business. It's, it's our largest set of enrollments is in, in, in business, sorry, business in the IC online. And we also have education programs <clears throat> and we're continuing to build a portfolio of online programs again for uh, adult uh, learners. We also added a health sciences major in this um, 
basket of new programs. Uh, we have a number of students who come to Illinois College because they're particularly interested in physical therapy or occupational therapy, for example, and the health sciences major is a perfect fit for, for them. We have long uh, hoped to have a clinical, four-year clinical nursing program at Illinois College. Uh, we hoped that after launching the online program, there might be an opportunity for us to add a clinical uh, nursing program. And these programs are very, very difficult to start. There are uh, significant accreditation uh, requirements in clinical nursing programs. And when, very sadly, the other very difficult news from last spring, of course, was that McMurray College announced closure. And they announced closure on March 20th. We had been in uh, some conversations with them about nursing uh, long before the pandemic and long before closure that we hoped that there might be opportunities for partnership. Sadly, we weren't able to get to that place because then they had this really gut-wrenching decision to make about closing the institution. We are committed to healthcare in this region, healthcare in the Jacksonville community. And I spoke with the, the uh, leadership of Memorial Health System and Pasadena Area Hospital about our interest in stepping into the breach of losing this really important clinical nursing program at McMurray. And so we were able to start our own program. Uh, some people have asked me, well, did you, um, did you just take and use and um, is, is it the McMurray program? And the answer is no, it's not. It's the IC program. We have had a director of nursing for two years uh, who is a very skilled uh, professional, uh, very tuned in to the accreditation process. She knows the world of nursing and wow, have we been lucky. We were scheduled uh, this fall for an accreditation visit for our online nursing program. And due to the confidence of the board in giving us the go ahead to move into this nursing clinical space, we have been able to launch and we did it within four months of, um, of with, with four months of work to launch Illinois College's clinical nursing program. I'm absolutely thrilled about this. Not only were we able to support McMurray College students who needed a new home, we welcomed them with open arms. We were so fortunate to hire the chair of the nursing program at McMurray to be Illinois College's program director for our undergraduate program. And we were able to hire other nurses, uh, nurse faculty from McMurray. And we moved into this with full force, clarity about purpose, and uh, this nursing program's underway. They are in their icy blue scrubs and they are going to make a difference in this world. So that's a, that's a big part of this growth. So I started this by saying 1150 is a big number for us. How did we get there? Part of it was, part of it is transfer students from McMurray. We have about 85 transfer students in total from McMurray. The other is that we have layered on all of these new programs. The other one I want to mention is agribusiness. Uh, we are currently in our fourth year of agribusiness, really well received in our community and among our students. Many of you know that the inaugural director, Dr. Michael Woods, uh, sadly left us at the end of September or the end of August. He has decided to move away from academia and uh, he is working in upstate New York in his field of agribusiness. And we were so excited for him and a big, uh, big hole to fill. But I want you to know that we're charging ahead. Dr. Kevin Klein, who is the chair of the business department and professor of economics, is leading the program right now. We've already launched a search for um, a new director. We hired a full-time faculty member, uh, another full-time faculty member uh, in August, and she began. She's a 
from a um, well-known uh, agribusiness family in this community, and we're so very, very pleased to have her on board. So that work, that work continues. I'm happy to answer other questions about programs, uh, but that gives you a feel for the dynamic nature of our work over a number of years to build the capacity to engage more students who want to come to Illinois College. I sh should also say that in that 1150 number is um, uh, dozens and dozens of first year nursing students who made the choice to come to Illinois College late in the game because we were able to put this program online. And we're really, really excited about that too. Another area of success that I, I want to note, and I think it's particularly important as the members of the Illinois College Society come together tonight to talk about Illinois College. Uh, you are the reason that we are having tremendous success in our inspiring achievement, the campaign for Illinois College. We've raised 40 million toward the $50 million goal. I mentioned Del Dunham earlier, uh, and Del is with us tonight. Uh, he is the chair of the campaign cabinet leading our work toward 50 million. So $10 million uh, left to raise. Uh, the success comes from, as I said, members like you who are part of the society. And I wanna thank Bob Chipman, class of 74, and Janet Chipman, class of 75, also with us tonight for being the co-chairs of the Illinois College Society. So what have we been able to accomplish with that extraordinary level of, of fundraising and gifts to the college of $40 million. We have uh, four or five main pillars of the campaign. And what we've been able to accomplish so far, and, and we continue, is increasing the number of students who are pursuing global study, internships, faculty, staff and faculty research, this active learning, this getting out into the world to think about your discipline, to have new experiences. Of course, sadly, right now, our international study abroad programs are um, not able to move forward until the world changes. Um, but the investments in this program are essential. We are committed to having every student have the opportunity to have at least one of these experiential learning opportunities during their time at Illinois College. Your gifts are also um, making a difference as you build annual scholarships, um, create endowed scholarships, as you make gifts to the college for annual, for scholarships that will be used uh, annually, as I said a moment ago. This is critical to us uh, to be able to recruit and retain uh, students. So um, essential. The need has never been greater. And um, we, I talk to students all the time who tell me, as I can imagine many of you feel this way, they could not be at Illinois College without the support of the scholarships that um, we offer to them. And that's just a statement of truth. And I think we all have this desire to pay it forward, right? Whether it is in scholarships or in other gifts to the college, it's our responsibility to care for and prepare the next generation of students. As part of this campaign, I've started an endowed scholarship in my name that um, is a really important opportunity for me to say how much it means to me that this institution can offer funds to students so that they can be here. We're also igniting learning and leadership through support for our faculty. We have commitments around endowed professorships and faculty development, so very, very important. We've also been focused on creating 21st century learning spaces. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I am in our most technologically advanced uh, classroom learning space on campus in the Dunham Auditorium. And we are committed to upgrades in technology across this campus because every single student 
um, needs to be fully embracing the role of technology in their lives and in their education. This isn't a one-off anymore. This is the world we live in. And as we look to the future, um, it's only become more essential that we have 21st century classrooms to create 21st century learners who are going to walk in this world with, with confidence. I also want to tell you that the investments that have been made because of your gifts to the athletics complex is just extraordinary. Uh, if you have not uh, had a chance and would like to see the um, virtual tour of campus that our Dean of Admission and uh, Evan Wilson gave as part of our virtual homecoming week, I am going to encourage you to watch it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a picture of what we are today and I think that whether you were on campus yesterday or you haven't been here for a while, you can be really, really proud. And I want to invite you back to campus. I hope you'll be here when we're able to, to gather. So what's happened down at Bruner? We added, uh, this was our very first project. We added lights on England Stadium uh, and to the Blatty Tennis Complex. And that was a huge deal. Um, this campus could not uh, make it right now without those lights on England Stadium, for example. Uh, in, a, in a normal cycle with competitions and so forth, it's given us so much flexibility, particularly for our soccer programs, because they can have night games. That means they're in their classes during the day rather than traveling to other sites. And uh, when I tell people that it was only six, six plus years ago when we didn't have lights. They say, well, it's impossible. How do we make it without lights? So thank you, everybody who, who made that lighting project possible. The bigger projects, though, that we've done have been the complete renovation of Joe Brooks baseball field and the Jessica Camp softball field. Uh, this was uh, a significant undertaking. And I want to thank uh, Trustee Jerry Beard, who led the effort. Uh, to raise the, the funds uh, needed to complete that project. Uh, we've also been doing work inside in Bruner. Uh, for those of you who recall that we had a couple of racquetball courts in Bruner, uh, those are now uh, have fitness and, and weight room. Uh, these are primarily for our students who are not part of the inter intercollegiate athletic program, but open to everybody and faculty and staff. Again, well received. We also gutted the Charlie Bellati um, weight room and we started from scratch and I need to um, name and remember with with great love Charlie Bellati who made a decision about a planned gift for Illinois College in his estate that was significant and it made it possible for us to make these significant changes a couple of years ago inside of Bruner, the Sherman Gymnasium, for example, and also the replacement of the turf. Uh, and, uh, you know, just want to remember Charlie as a great citizen who loved Illinois College and loved Illinois College athletics. The scoreboard is in his name. Uh, that's out inside an England stadium. The other big piece of the campaign, and again, thank you, thank you for being Illinois College Society members of uh, this campaign. It's the annual fund, and the annual fund is essential to the work that we do every single day. Uh, our theme this year uh, is going to be Together I See, because we have got to lock arms and keep this college moving forward with grace and grit uh, as we get to the other side of this pandemic. And so I thank you in advance for your gifts to the IC Fund this year. I thank you for your gifts to the campaign to date. And I ask you to continue to think of us as you look at your priorities for philanthropy because there's so much to do and we promise to invest your gifts wisely to support the, the, the success of our students. I mean, that's the, fundamentally what it's all about. It's inspiring achievement, the campaign for Illinois College. Mark your calendars. Our 
annual day of giving is going to be on March 10th. And so you'll be hearing a lot about that. Lots of good news uh, in this context of a surreal world and environment in which we find ourselves today. A number of you asked questions about what it's just like to be on campus right now and what are students doing and uh, how have things changed because of the pandemic. So let me give you um, a few examples. The literary societies are up and running. Uh, of course, it has been uh, a lot, they've been giving a lot of thought uh, to how to have a virtual presence and, and virtual experiences. Uh, and I think they've done a terrific job. And I want to thank those of you who have volunteered to be judges or have just joined their productions to see how things are uh, with them. The, uh, I think things are going very well. Um, you know, unfortunately, Beecher Hall and Smith House, the David A. Smith House, are not open this fall. Uh, we were not able to um, make those places or reconfigure them in a way that we felt would be safe for the students. And so they are, they are doing productions outside of those spaces and they are doing them virtually. They are also keen to uh, have activities with each other. Some of that is done virtually, but the, the societies are also finding ways to do socials and to do joint activities. As I said, because the weather has been so sensational uh, on campus, they've been able to go outside and have those gatherings together outside. We'll have a showcase uh, that's a virtual showcase uh, later this semester, and I'm looking forward to that. I always love uh, seeing what our students are doing in the literary societies. We've had to postpone the recruitment uh, until the springtime. Again, we, we hope that we will be in a place where there will be a little more flexibility and that students will be able to, the recruiting process that might be a little different will certainly have to meet some important guidelines, but the, that will go on. And in the meantime, uh, students are finding each other and they are spending each time together and they are uh, supporting each other and moving ahead on their productions. I also had questions about athletics. I serve on the President's Council of the Midwest Conference. I'm the chair elect and am really fortunate to work with a marvelous group of presidential colleagues overseeing our athletics uh, conference and led by a superb executive director by the name of Heather Benning, who's based at Grinnell. Uh, you can imagine that throughout the summer, uh, we were in constant contact with each other. Uh, we were on pins and needles, really, about what was going to happen with athletics and the contingency plans that we had to have in place for athletics. We were watching very, very carefully uh, what was happening at the NCAA. Mike Snyder, our director of athletics, uh, was working with his counterparts in Midwest Conference. He was engaged uh, in discussions at the NCAA level. Uh, I can't tell you how many webinars uh, our, our staff have been on over the last six months to gather information to do the work that we need to do. We all hoped that we'd be able to have a competitive season. I'm so proud of the athletic subgroup for the planning they did as one contingency plan was that we would go ahead with a sports season if we had the capacity to do it, if the conference moved forward, if the NCAA allowed for it. And we were thinking about, well, what happens if, if we can't do that? And ultimately, the um, Midwest Conference Presidents Council uh, decided to suspend the competitive season for all sports through December 31st of 2020. And there were a lot of reasons for doing that. And uh, we had already been thinking about uh, a different kind of schedule. For example, if there had been competitions, we would have divided the Midwest Conference into a North Division and a South Division. We wouldn't have had any overnight travel. We would have played you know, Monmouth twice if that's what it took to get a schedule in. Uh, Sadly, we weren't able to get that far, but that was the, the level of planning and you know, as, as 
down to the what do you do when the students get back from a competition with their uniforms and what's going to happen on the buses well it didn't it didn't come all in, it didn't come to place but that planning uh was there ultimately um the situation was too unstable to um, go forward with a competitive season. There were also some um, very, very strict guidelines around testing uh, at the PCR level, which is the highest level of testing for COVID-19 that uh, the NCAA was recommending or requiring, really. And uh, as, conf as a conference, we recognized that it just wasn't feasible. Um, in this moment to go forward with uh, competition, both because I said, because this, the, the environment was just too unstable and the testing requirements were so steep that it was not the case that every single college in the conference would be able to meet those requirements. And so we agreed that um, the best course of action was to suspend competition. And that was a hard decision to make and a hard, moment for me with our coaches. I had been working very closely with Mike Snyder and our coaches this summer. I oversee athletics at the college. And so I'm um, intimately aware of what they um, are planning for and how they are conducting their, their work. So there it is. Uh, but the conference did not say you can't practice. In fact, encouraged us to figure out a way for our students to practice. And so we were, um, we took this in stages. When campus opened for classes, uh, except for the classrooms in Bruner, Bruner was closed to everyone. And then we went out a week and we had, uh, we opened up the outside facilities, um, socially distanced, masked, et cetera. And then we opened up another layer in Bruner. And then finally on September 14th, we uh, allowed the fall sports teams and those teams like softball and baseball that do, they are allowed to practice in the fall to go forward with practices. Again, very strict guidelines about what they can do. But I think there was just a huge sigh of relief um, among our athletes and our coaching staff that we could move into some, you know, what we can call normal today. Uh, and normal today is that you are in a small pod that you have a mask on, that when you go to Bruner to practice, they're gonna take your temperature again. You have to show them that you've got a green dot on your app. And that's the only way you're gonna get past the door. And, uh, and so that's what we do. And I've had a chance to walk about the complex to see our volleyball, our new volleyball coach um, inside and our sports teams outside. And what a joy to see them um, doing things that they just have been waiting to do. And we are doing all we can to keep them safe. The President's Council of the Midwest uh, League met last week and we decided to wait until mid-November to make a decision about competition for the winter sports, um, primarily basketball. Uh, and we'll make that decision in mid-November. Uh, at the earliest, uh, competition for basketball would be in early February because if students, when students come back at the beginning of January, due to NCAA requirements, there is a month where there is a process called the resocialization process so that we know that everybody is healthy and can take part in the full extent of competition. And we're going to need to see where testing is uh, for athletics. We understand that the um, NCAA may sanction different kinds of tests, which would open it up, it would reduce some of the costs. And so we're watching that very carefully. Uh, baseball, softball, and, and golf are spring sports. Uh, I suspect we'll make a decision about the spring sports uh, in January, uh, mid to late January as well. I can tell you, uh, again, sadly, uh, there will be no spring break trips this, this year. Uh, the baseball team and softball team, uh, our teams were actually one of the very few teams to get in a spring break, uh, spring training trip last year because ours in, the, in um, February, March, because our spring break was so early last year, they got home right as things were starting to um, 
looked challenging and the world was changing. And so there are a lot of schools in the Midwest Conference that did not get their normal Florida trips in last year. Sadly, they are not going to happen this year um, either. So we will, we will stand by and, and stay tuned uh, to what's going to happen at the NCAA. The uh, just last couple of things I'd like to say, and they are that um, the academic schedule for next spring is being considered by the faculty uh, as we speak, and I'll have an announcement about that probably next week. I had a question from you about uh, faculty searches and want to let you know that there are four faculty searches this year. They are in agribusiness, as I mentioned earlier, education psychology and nursing. So those are the four full-time positions that we're searching for right now. So last words. Um, it is, um, I've given a lot of thought over these months to everything that Illinois College has been through as a, as a college since 1829. We are soon going to be talking about our bicentennial Conversations, of course, are already starting to happen on campus about plans for it. And this college has shown a remarkable level of resiliency and determination and grit through wars, through uh, the flu pandemic of another century. Um, there have been lots of challenges along the way from our founding. And what I wanna leave with you tonight is that that Illinois College persists. You know, we are guided by our founders. We are guided by the necessity that Illinois College must persevere. We must be here for the next generation and the generation after that. And I tell you from the hilltop tonight that everything that I see on this campus and from you as alumni and as major donors to this institution is a deep love and regard for Illinois College and an absolute commitment that we must move forward. We must move forward together and we must move forward boldly to move to the other side. We will be a changed institution on the other side of this pandemic. And that can be a good thing. We're going to gain from our lessons and we're gonna be ready to march into whatever that world looks like when the pandemic is in the rear view mirror. So thank you very much uh, for this time. I'm gonna ask Stephanie Chipman to join. I will tell you some of uh, our members on this call are from the Alumni Association Board of Directors and welcome to all of you, including Marcy Burris, who is the president elect. I have a chance to talk with that group tomorrow and I look forward to that. So Stephanie, uh, thank you for joining us. Stephanie Chipman, do we have questions, Stephanie, that I can address? If you'd like to ask a question, please put your question or comment in the Q&A section and I'd be happy to moderate a question and answer with President Farley. Happy to tackle any question you'd like to ask me. It's great to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well. Stephanie, any questions coming our way? No questions yet. All right. Well, I, if, if there are no questions, uh, I will uh, bring our evening to a close at eight o'clock. I think we should hop off because at eight o'clock there's gonna be a special uh, program from the drum line and our cheer squad. And uh, so co-curricular new program, one of those new programs we added is the drum line. Uh, Tyler Carpenter is the, uh, the new drum line director. And for those of you who live in Jacksonville and you live anywhere close to the campus, you have heard them perform our practice. They are practicing on the corner of West College Avenue and um, Lockwood Place. And I've had a lot of fun listening to them from Barnes House. 
Again, I want to congratulate our reunion um, alumni. Happy homecoming week to all of you. And I promise as soon as it's possible to be back together, we shall be back together on the hilltop. Until then, be proud of your, your students, proud of your faculty, and proud of the colleagues I get to work with every single day who are moving this college forward. Thank you so much for being here tonight.